All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session six, Maritime Security, a Commonality of Purpose. It is my pleasure to welcome to the stage the following panel members, Rear Admiral Wendy Malcolm, Dr. Christian Buger, Professor Maria rost Vice Admiral Karen Burr Singh, Ms. Jane Chan, and the Associate Professor David Letts. The chair of this panel is Rear Admiral Malcolm, Rear Admiral Malcolm joined the Royal Australian Navy in 1987 and has served as a supply officer throughout her career. She left the Navy briefly in 2015 to take up a position with Saab Australia as part of the Anzac class frigate project before returning to the Navy in late 2017. As the head of maritime systems, she is responsible for both maintaining and sustaining the fleet. Ma'am, welcome, and I invite you to kick off the session. Terrific. Thanks so much, Kat, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to the panel session this afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, and very much welcome our fantastic panel members that we're going to be hearing from this afternoon. With no universal definition, maritime security has evolved beyond a set of policy buzzwords. Since 2009, Australia's concept of maritime security has generally been considered through foreign policy initiatives. Australia has global interests across a broad range of strategic, economic and foreign policy issues. Strategic guidance in 2016 restated Australia's foreign policy initiatives that would be achieved through maritime security activities. Firstly, it argued that Australian maritime security depends upon contribution and cooperation with the United States and regional partners. The second contention was the Pacific Maritime Security Program remains a cornerstone of Australia's defence engagement across the South Pacific, a program very close to my heart as I support the sustainment of the Guardian class patrol boats. Thirdly, maritime security activities would advance cooperation and enhance bilateral relations with like-minded partners in Southeast Asia Last, maritime security has been introduced to Australia's Track 1 diplomacy schedule. But what is maritime security? How might we prioritise challenges in the maritime domain? How might these challenges be interlinked? And how might these various challenges be addressed? Moreover, what issues should be included under the maritime security umbrella? For example, <laughs> should climate change or disasters at sea be considered? This session is designed to deep dive into the ambiguous and amorphous concept of maritime security and reveal its domains and characteristics, which will illuminate its fundamental elements that will be of benefit to the practitioner and policy maker alike. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a global expert on maritime security who will provide this afternoon's keynote address, Dr. Buger. Christian Buger is Professor of International Relations with a research focus on global governance and international organisation, the oceans and maritime security, international relations theory, in particular practice theory and international political sociology, as well as sociology of expertise. In his current work, Dr. Buger is studying political responses to maritime insecurity and the knowledge, resources, and technologies required to govern the oceans. Dr. Buger, I invite you to address the conference. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here, and a big thank you for the, to the Australian Navy and the Sea Power Centre for, <clears throat> for the invitation. I've heard many great things uh, about the Sea Power Conference in the past, so it's a pleasure to be here. Not the least that I can now officially confirm that all of the good things are actually true. Now, what I would like to offer you here today is two things. Firstly, I like to give a little bit of context. I shall argue if we are interested in maritime security and also commonality of purpose, then we need to see sea power as well as maritime security in the context of our approach towards the oceans. So 
Maritime security is in essence one way of how to think about the oceans and our relationship to it. Secondly, I would like to invite you to explore together with me how our understanding of maritime security has actually evolved over the past two decades. Why is that interesting? Because it gives us an understanding of how we got where we are right now. It gives us a sort of history of the presence and it might also tell us uh, what we are missing or where our priorities perhaps should be or where we have lost course and so on. Now to start with the big picture. I think it is quite noteworthy actually that over the last five to ten years the oceans in general have received unprecedented global political attention. This year, in 2022 alone, there are seven global multilateral conferences that address the oceans and how they can be better governed. They are conferences that try to find solutions for how the oceans and marine life can be better protected, how marine resources can be used sustainably under the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but also how oceanic activity can be better safeguarded. Now, many of these debates, such as at the Our Ocean Conference, are focused on the blue economy, they are focused on ocean health, or they are focused on blue justice. But we would make a mistake if we would think that maritime security is not a part of it. Exactly the opposite is true. These conferences very often do not pay sufficient attention to maritime security. And unfortunately, the same can often be said for formats such as this one. Very often, we do not pay enough attention to the blue economy, to ocean health, as well as blue justice. Now, maritime security is also part of this new attention towards the oceans. And it's actually quite spectacular of how uh, maritime security has developed from a marginal concern in the 1990s to a high level priority. And perhaps the best bit of evidence was actually provided last autumn when the UN Security Council for the first time ever had its open debate on maritime security, and it was not a regular UN Security Council debate. No, it was carried out at heads of state level. So Mr. Uh, Modi opened the session and uh, Mr. Putin was there. The US was represented by its Minister of Foreign Affairs. Now, this debate actually is a very good example, not only for the high level of attention to maritime security, but also for the fact that many states actually agree on what is at stake, what should be addressed here. And interestingly enough, that it literally cuts across um, all global divides that we usually see. It was Russia, it was India, it was China, it was the US, it was the UK, it was France, it was Kenya, and so on. They all agreed on the common challenges. So it is actually important to know that there is a core of maritime security concerns that are globally shared. Now, there's a lot of diversity in precise definitions of a maritime security. And quite obviously, countries set different priorities. There's nothing surprising in principle about it. But of course, it puts us a little bit in, in, the, uh, in the difficulty of how we might want to conceptualize it. And uh, the way we have to come to think about this at the University of Copenhagen, where I'm based, is that maritime security has three core dimensions to it. It is firstly an interstate dimension, and here we are talking about all this sea power stuff, power projection, interstate disputes, or increasingly 
gray zone war oper warfare operations, what was the content of the last uh, session. Secondly, the second pillar, maritime terrorism, that is a threat from non-state actors which pursue political objectives. And then thirdly, blue crime, that is threats from non-state actors that pursue economic objectives. And here we, are, uh, we need to consider piracy, all sorts of smuggling activities, and uh, quite obviously also in the environmental crimes, such as illicit fishing, but also uh, a wide range of pollution crimes. So three dimensions of maritime security. Let me use these three dimensions now to very quickly uh, run through the history of maritime security. And I shall argue that the history of maritime security, its evolution is actually best captured in a series of waves. Overall, I like to distinguish between four different waves. Right now, we are in the fourth wave. And then allow me to add in with, uh, to end with the question of whether there's a fifth wave on the horizon. Wave number two stands for the emergence of maritime security. Now, the concept of maritime security became prominent in the late 1990s, and it shifted um, security thinking towards non-state actors. And back then, it was primarily pirates, uh, first in Southeast Asia, <clears throat> then in Somalia. Then gradually, it became the fear over maritime terrorism and the potential impact of an attack actually carried out by a shipping vessel, either on a, on a port or another uh, maritime installation. This was the first wave, the emergence of maritime security. And that actually caused a remarkable shift in security thinking. Because in this understanding for the first time, it was not only what other navies or military actors are doing, but basically any kind of civil maritime activity became potentially security relevant and potentially a threat. What was the outcome of that wave? Well, it brought us the broad range of maritime domain awareness programs, which are, after all, uh, centered on the idea to know and understand any kind of uh, maritime activity and its relevance for security. The second wave was then a consolidation of maritime uh, security thinking, and political actors started uh, to recognize the diversity of maritime security threats. And here we are now about in the 20 tenors. And it was gradually also being recognized that maritime security is not something that lends itself to a quick fix, where you would say send an operation uh, to a particular region, to a particular hotspot to fix things. Paradigmatically, the response in, uh, to Som Somali piracy but it was recognized that uh, these operations endure. The uh, European operation uh, Atalanta, for instance, now is there for 12 years. It was launched as a quick fix uh, to do something about piracy. So this was gradually being, being recognized, and uh, the outcome of that were all the broad range of maritime security strategies. And it's actually interesting how uh, at pretty much the same time, all major security actors issued maritime security strategies, the EU, India, France, Spain, the UK, Australia, and so on. Now, what many of these strategies also did was to install new coordination mechanisms, committees, and so on. So there was actually a lot of organizational reform happening around this. So wave two then concludes with new governance structures on a national and regional level. Wave three then stands for an expansion of that kind of thinking. And that was, first of all, the attempt to introduce 
maritime domain awareness globally, drawing on pioneering initiatives uh, such as the Information Fusion Center in Singapore, but also platforms such as the American Sea Vision or the European Union's several uh, platforms. It is also the way where we are then seeing significant investments in capacity building globally, and that is driven by the hope that countries could take over full responsibility over their national waters and do something about the, uh, the maritime security threats. A good example for this growth industry in capacity building as part of that wave is actually the uh, Global Maritime Crime Program of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, which started in 2008 as a small prison support program in Kenya, and today it's a globally spanning enterprise with hundreds of staff providing capacity building for maritime security around the world. So this global expansion is actually quite, uh, quite significant. Now, through these capacity building engagements, something important also happens in this third wave. In order to convince countries to actually invest into maritime security, one of the easiest ways to do that was to show the economic benefits of maritime security. In other words, in this wave, maritime security meets the blue economy, and a lot of countries in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere discover that there is substantial economic growth at stake. And the blue economy, after all, stands for the hope that this economic gro growth can be exploited. Uh, without harming the environment too much or even sustainably uh, managing it. Now, this link is actually quite important between uh, uh, blue economy and the maritime security because now maritime security was no longer this demand that global powers actually put on smaller states because uh, now what was at stake it was the economic future and the employment opportunities of those smaller states. It was no longer that maritime security was just considered to be a problem that the West has or the rich trading nations. Something else happens in that uh, wave. Paying attention to the blue economy also instantly led to a changing key priority. Illicit fishing now became a, a key concern, both as an environmental, as an economic, but also as a crime that facilitates all the other maritime insecurities that can facilitate smuggling, corruption, and, to, and so on. However, illicit fishing is in comparison to piracy and in comparison to maritime ter terrorism, a much more contested issue. Why is that the case? Because the involvement of states in illicit fishing activities is debated. And here, for instance, you can see one of these moments where the UN Security Council does not agree uh, whether illicit fishing or illegal fishing or IUU, however you want to conceptualize it, should be considered as a threat to peace and security. That brings me to the uh, fourth wave uh, that we are presently in. And in this wave, something spectacular happens again, uh, which is that maritime security is now interpreted through geopolitical lenses. It is now a geopolitical problem. It is no longer blue crime or maritime terrorism that stands in the center of attention, but it is now, uh, once again, the interstate dimension. And this is in particular linked to the emergence of the uh, Indo-Pacific narrative as a key maritime theater, where it's now that maritime security is primarily equated with freedom of navigation operations, permanent military presences, 
you could, you could have seen, or you, you will have seen the Europeans, all of them now heavily uh, thinking about it in these terms, but also a growing naval build up. Now, I'm a bit skeptical where this turn to geopolitics will eventually lead us. The key challenges of maritime security continue to be linked to blue crime and terrorism. There's a risk that these problems that actually matter to people drop out of sight. And quite obviously, these are also uh, problems that primarily call for maritime law enforcement. Will we leave these, uh, this fourth wave behind? I hope so. Not the least because it has quite a number of maritime security issues which are now on the horizon and which also need uh, attention. Our challenge in the new wave will be how to link maritime security much closer to the broader ocean governance uh, debate. Marine protected areas, for instance, require effective uh, law enforcement and hence the toolbox of maritime uh, security and also many of the dangers to ocean health. Pollution, for instance, call for maritime security provisions. So it's literally the time now that the maritime security discussion engages with ocean governance and that we ask the question of how we can better uh, identify synergies what is the role of navies in law enforcement? What can be the role of navies in safeguarding marine protected areas, in particular uh, in the way they, they will be emerging also on the high seas? We also need to talk about uh, the climate crisis and how it will lead to new expressions of crime at sea, and also what kind of particular demands it will put on uh, law enforcement at sea. Lastly, and I think this is a dimension that has been a little bit forgotten in the maritime security debates at least, is we also need to be highly aware that uh, maritime security is not only about the surface of the sea, but also about the deep sea. And here we're talking about the protection of critical undersea infrastructures, most importantly, the data cables that our internet runs on, but also increasingly the electricity cables that uh, solar and wind uh, installations uh, depend on. And potentially we should also keep an eye on what is going to happen in terms of deep seabed mining. So we really need to feed the subsea into our maritime security thinking and eventually also need tailored approaches to this. And that might include, for instance, uh, undersea, underwater domain awareness that complements regular MDA. Now to conclude, in many ways, the maritime security history is a story of commonality. It is something <clears throat> that tells us what international actu actors actually can achieve together. And for me, it's still, uh, a miracle on the one side that Somali piracy could be curbed down within less than four years, but on the other side, it is not a miracle because it was a, a nations acting in concert uh, with each other. Quite obviously, I'm not naive and I'm highly aware that the, uh, the current political situation is difficult and we are looking into difficult times, but let's not forget that even under the conditions of uh, the Cold War, there was a lot of interaction, there was a lot of uh, collaboration between the superpowers to address particular issues. And I think maritime security lends itself also to deal with, with this. So we need to strengthen maritime security as a component of ocean governance, address blue crimes, but also ensure ocean health and blue justice. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ruger, and uh, very much look forward to uh, panel questions on our keynote speaker.
Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Maria rost uh, who's currently Associate Professor of International Relations at Monash University. Uh, Professor Rublay holds a PhD from George Washington University. Prior to starting with Monash University, Professor Rublay was a senior lecturer at the Australian National University and was chair of the Task Force on Diversity and Security Studies at the International Studies Association. She has an expertise and focus on nuclear weapon proliferation, deterrence and politics, women in national security studies and policy making, and gender and international security. Doctor, I welcome you to address the conference. Thank you very much. I, here or up there? Please. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us here. Uh, so what I'm going to speak today, today about um, is the social construction of maritime security. And I think this fits in really nicely from our keynote, thinking about the third wave, how maritime security is now being, uh, those who are interested in geopolitical trends, geopolitical um, challenges, power projection, are thinking about maritime very, secure, very seriously. My own background is in international security, and typically when we think about um, any issue in international security, we te there tends to be a focus on material analysis, on material factors that drive state behavior, uh, perceptions and behavior. And so as, with this wave in maritime security, um, with geopolitical thinking, concern, strategies, um, there is some concern, uh, I feel some concern, that we might be caught up too much in material factors and not enough in the ideational factors that construct perceptions and policy within maritime security. And of course, material factors are important. There's no question about it. You have um, land and accompanying EEZs. You have naval, naval capacity to, to defend. Um, you have sea militias formed um, with the help of, of countries and, and sometimes not. You have maritime domain awareness. You have shipping lanes. You have um, you know, environmentally protected areas. So there's a lot of material factors to consider when it comes to maritime security. Um, and prior to joining academia, um, I was an intelligence officer for the US Department of Defense. And of course, one of the things we paid attention to was uh, material capabilities. But also, as you can imagine, we would pay attention to factors such as culture, historical legacies, emotional beliefs of leaders and of domestic populaces. And these are important to understanding and predicting any issue in international security, um, including, I want to argue, maritime security. So I'd like to take just a few brief minutes to talk about four key ideational factors that are important to maritime security. And again, not saying that these are more important than material factors, but rather these are factors that tend to get lost when international security analysts, um, you know, coming from outside the field look in because that tends to be uh, sort of the structure of, of how they um, analyze any issue. So these four issues are, um, first is national identity. So national identity, and I'll give you just a few examples for each of these, how they can shape maritime security perceptions and through that uh, maritime security policy. So national identity can become attached to maritime boundaries and not just current maritime boundaries, of course, but former maritime boundaries. And so that national identity, um, nationalism, um, domestic populist sentiments become connected to boundaries that are seen as you know, our rightful boundaries and can lead countries to defend those boundaries in ways that might not otherwise be predicted. Um, you may be familiar with Robert Ross's analysis of Chinese nationalism and how that has fed and strengthened Chinese navalism. Uh, another example is how it can play into domestic politics. For example, there's been work done by James Manicon looking at how within Canada, um, national identity has fed into some of the rigidity in Canadian policy around Arctic um, maritime debates and, and concerns over passages. 
A second key ideational factor I'd, I'd remind us that is quite important are relationships. Relationships between states can influence the way we perceive security threats and the way we shape our policy, the way we, we think about policy and come up with options and weigh costs and benefits to it. And by relationships, I don't mean just positive ones. For example, historical rivalries can feed into othering rival claimants. Um, so if you had potentially claimants who didn't have um, significant historical rivalries, it, that may play out differently when you do have historical legacies where you've already cast the opposing party into othering, into the other, and make it easier to, um, for example, play up to the domestic poli um, to your domestic poli polity. Um, strong relationships also, not just negative relations, can feed into maritime security perceptions. For example, it can lead to overlooking significant practical or tactical or even strategic aspects of maritime planning and purchasing. Um, even when it comes to um, maritime domain awareness infrastructure, we heard this morning in an earlier session how um, MDA, what we really need for MDA structures to work properly is to network the networks. But this can't really fully be developed unless there's trust, unless the two parties know each other, so that when there's conflicts coming in when you've, uh, with fusion, um, one party can say to the other, this is the case, this is the data, even though the other data may say otherwise. And if the party knows and trusts the other party, okay, that's what we'll do, we accept that. If you don't have that trust, it's impossible. So from levels from um, MDA infrastructure to maritime purchasing and planning, all the way up to broader strategic thinking, uh, relationships can influence the way that maritime security perceptions and policies play out. The third key factor I want to talk about, we have identity, relationships. Um, a third is the way we reconceptualize maritime and the way we reconceptualize security. And these reconceptualizations usually come at times of crisis. And so, for example, after 9-11, um, there's been research done looking at how the, the idea of what security is led to significant securitization of maritime infrastructure. And of course, we've, we know some of that here in Australia with concerns about um, the, the port of Darwin. Um, now with climate crisis, again, reconceptualizations about security and how that influences what we what we think about maritime policies and how those policies should, should change to meet this new definition of security. Um, we're seeing that at play right now. Just, you know, I'm sure it's happening in every panel where climate is coming up and what are we going to do about climate? And so these reconceptualizations of how we even think about security are going to influence our maritime policies. And the fourth key ideational factor that I would raise um, are evolving international knowledge structures. So, you know, what we know about maritime is not sort of naturally out there in the world. These are things that are socially constructed. And, you know, of course, we have it um, with the start of UNCLOSE, um, the identity ripple effects of the parcelization of the sea as a result of UNCLOSE. Um, but we're seeing it even today the development of discourse and institutions that name, define, and address the problems of maritime security, for example, of what is maritime piracy. Um, even IUU, um, you know, we've heard, I've heard people today say, you know, we can't, agree, we can't agree on what illegal fishing is. And so how these terms are constructed and who gets to control the construction of them is critically important. Um, how maritime discourse can frame issues into either competitive policy approaches or cooperative policy approaches. Again, realizing that, of course, there are material interests at play, but it's also the knowledge structures and the, uh, the evolution of them that play a role in this as well, so they interact. So um, I'd like to just conclude by talking about how do we use these four factors and national identity, relationships, um, reconceptualizations of security, and evolving international knowledge structures. 
Well, I would posit there are at least two key ways we should be thinking about these four analytical factors. Um, to, to make sure that we have integrated analysis, material and ideational factors. The first is introspection to understand our own country's maritime perceptions and policies. To think about what's driving our current maritime perceptions and policies. And are, are these perceptions and policies um, taking us the way we want to go in terms of where we're doing our planning, where we're doing our budgeting, where we're doing our purchasing, where we're doing our partnerships? Because I can tell you every country um, is driven at least in part by some of these ideational factors. The second way we can use this um, is to, under how to understand other countries. Because again, if we're only thinking about other countries' maritime policies, um, their purchasing, their equipment, their capabilities, in terms of material factors, we're going to miss a lot. And we really need to be willing to be open to the idea that things such as um, national history, na uh, nationalism, historical rivalries, um, strong relationships between countries, um, for example, um, you know, important roles within these knowledge structures and the evolving knowledge structures and how that might pitch a country one way or the other. Um, and if we really want to understand, if we want to have a commonality of purpose within the region, within the Indo-Pacific, we've got to think about, okay, when we think of, when we're, we're trying to understand other states' ideas about maritime security and trying to understand their decisions that we look beyond just the material. And we can think that, um, you know, Solomon Islands, um, Djibouti, other countries that perhaps decisions may not be so much of a surprise if we look not just at material factors, but over, have a broad integrated analysis. And I'd just like to conclude by saying, indeed, I think it's really important. And that's one thing I, I want to, I think has been so well done here at Sea Power is to talk not just about great powers, but to talk about regional countries, to talk about all the countries that have a stake in maritime security here within the Indo-Pacific, because maritime policy happens not just um, within the great power context, but it occurs within a regional context and within bilateral contexts. And so it's just as important to understand smaller countries as it is, and their perceptions, their identities, their histories, um, as well as the great powers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome uh, Admiral Singh uh, to address us. Uh, Admiral Singh was the Republic of India's 24th Chief of the Naval Staff from May 2019 to November 2021. An alumnus of the National Defence Academy, the Defence Services Staff College Wellington and the College of Naval Warfare Mumbai the Admiral was commissioned into the Indian Navy in July of 1980. Admiral Singh is currently the chair of the National Maritime Foundation, India's premier maritime think tank. Uh, sir, I invite you to address the conference. Thank you. May I speak from here? Certainly, sir. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's been uh, extremely enriching for myself and the team from National Maritime Foundation uh, to have been a part of this uh, absolutely fabulous uh, CPAR conference. And I wish to profusely thank the organizers and the Royal Australian Navy for affording us this uh, opportunity to participate. I'm also honored and privileged to be a part of this very distinguished panel. You know, when one looks at this uh, very laudable theme selected for this conference and indeed this session, which is the commonality of purpose the thought that crosses uh, one's mind is, how do we identify the purpose, which has universal appeal and acceptability, and which could then uh, lead to commonality? And to my mind, uh, the answer to this question is pretty clear. We all know that the overarching purpose of nearly all nations is to secure the economic, material, and societal well-being of their people. And it is from here that we must identify and draw the unifying commonality of purpose. In the maritime domain, 
This would translate into ensuring maritime security, or in other words, the freedom from threats emanating at or from the sea. And these threats include traditional as well as non-traditional ones, natural as well as man-made, and even a combination of both. We've heard eminent speakers and panelists before me delve into various facets of maritime security. I think the end state of maritime security, to my mind, uh, would be an environment that is secure, inclusive, cooperative and collaborative, open and transparent, that promotes dialogue and respect for established international law and a democratic rule-based international order in which all nations, small and large, uh, thrive as equal and sovereign. And uh, when you look at this in a collective sense, I put it to you, we could therefore refer to this broad underlying commonality of purpose as SAGAR, which is an acronym for security and growth for all in the region. And in Hindi means the ocean. And there are very, um, you know, various constituents of security and growth in, in the maritime domain. Um, just to name a few, ensuring safety of merchantmen and seafarers, free access to the global commons, countering the threats posed by maritime crime, a degree of insurance against climate change and natural disasters, and of course, peace and stability in the maritime neighborhood. And now given this vast expanse of the Indo-Pacific that we are talking about, the transnational character of this endeavor that we are again talking about, and indeed the transnational nature of the challenges faced, it is absolutely clear that no one nation can do it alone. And the only way to achieve this common purpose is through cooperation and collaboration. And whilst we seek to uh, promote a collaborative and consultative approach to maritime security, and we must also constantly be exploring new avenues for cooperation. More importantly, uh, we must also consciously inculcate habits of cooperation. Here I allude to what uh, Admiral Ray Griggs, as the IONS chair in 2014, had stressed upon. In his opening uh, address, he had, uh, Admiral Griggs had said that if we, if we have the habit of cooperation, the mechanics of uh, cooperation become easier. And this begs the question, how do we develop this habit or these habits of cooperation? Perhaps this might require uh, deeper deliberations but at this time, I think we could begin by being forward-leaning in all our interactions with each other and by strengthening institutional mechanisms so that the manner and method of cooperation itself is institutionalized. And in this regard, uh, you all in Australia don't have to look very far. During my time as Chief of Naval Staff of the Indian Navy, it was an inspiration to see Admiral Noonan take an absolutely proactive and result oriented approach, which provided so much energy uh, just to the uh, RAN and IN cooperation. You know, you all know the Royal Australian Navy participated in Malabar after a gap of 13 years. We signed the mutual logistics support agreement. He and I issued the joint guidance for Australia and Indian Navy to Navy relations. These, all these happened because of this well-developed habits of cooperation that your leader uh, so well uh, and, uh, you know, has in his character. Also, uh, if you see Admiral Aquilino, the Syncpa, then Syncpac fleet, and the present CNC, Indo-PACOM, uh, he was unfazed by the COVID pandemic. The natural tendency in a pandemic is to look inwards. But he kept ideas and initiatives flowing at a fast, fast pace. And just, an, just, just as an example, he started the bi-monthly key leader engagement to keep chiefs of Navy in the Indo-Pacific in touch. So both these very inspirational leaders showed how well-honed habits of cooperation can motivate others to walk the path of cooperation. Are there challenges in walking this path? The short answer, of course, is yes, because this commonality of purpose is not shared by all, which is evident in some nations' disregard for international law unilateral actions bordering on coercion, and divergent interpretations of global commons. And this will pose a serious set of challenges to maritime security. But being an eternal optimist, 
I would say that the challenges or opportunities are spelled differently. Just like the Sagar Manthan, which in Hindu mythology was a churn of the oceans, threw up the elixir of life, so would the present churn in the Indo-Pacific, to my mind, throw up new opportunities. In fact, challenges posed by certain revisionist nations must shake us out of our complacency and spur us on to redouble our efforts to cooperate even more closely. And ideas for cooperation must flow unchecked, whether through bilaterals, minilaterals, multilaterals, partnerships, issue-based convergence, etc. Because all these interactions lead to better communications, trust, and even greater convergences. It's a virtuous cycle of cooperation. And there's room here for all powers, large, middle, small, to contribute in this endeavor. We should create this spider's web of convergences. It'll help us ens uh, ensnare any inimical power with who, who decides to do otherwise. Lest my talk only becomes uh, rhetoric, I'd like to suggest some possibilities to enhance cooperation as we move on uh, on the path of commonality of purpose in the maritime domain. The first is to build collective maritime competence in our respective neighborhoods. Start with the neighborhood, but this is one way. When I say maritime, when I say collective maritime competence, and when I say maritime, I don't mean only the Navy, but a larger maritime competence, ranging from things like building marine infrastructure, help in framing robust national laws, identifying law enforcement agencies to best exploit the provisions of the conventions like UNCLOS. Training today is in the competitive space and needs to be bespoke to the challenges faced. Capacity building for surveillance of larger EZs is another area. So there are many, several opportunities to build this collective maritime uh, competence. And here, all nations, to my mind, need to work together. Needless to say, the big, bigger nations would need to do the heavy lifting by providing leadership. And when you're building this collective maritime competence, two Cs are important. The first C is credibility, which can be achieved by closing the gap between promise and delivery. And the second C is customizing one's pitch in terms of what the recipient nation holds dear. Our engagements must see challenges through our neighbor's prism to be effective. The previous speaker, she mentioned this. For example, I'll just give you an example. Drug smuggling uh, that threatens uh, tourism-oriented economies of Mauritius, Maldives, Seychelles, and Sri Lanka is what we must focus on, because that is what they want, to control this. There's little point in lecturing others in, on great power competition, etc. The second opportunity that I wish to bring out is by becoming part of initiatives uh, one that I would like to uh, share with the audience is the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, the IPOI. The IPOI, it identifies a set of seven deeply interconnected areas of common interest, like maritime security, uh, mar marine ecology, capacity building, and resource sharing, etc., and seeks ideas, plans, and uh, uh, projects from all actors within the Indo-Pacific, by which the opportunities inherent in each such area may best be availed to regional benefit. Open architecture initiatives such as the IPOI offer immense opportunity for collaboration in pursuit of the common purpose. And these opportunities could be capitalized upon and it is heartening to see Australia, Japan, France, and recently UK taking a lead partner role in this initiative. And in the forthcoming Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue, which the National Maritime Foundation hosts end of the year, our plan is to discuss in depth the opportunities that the IPOI offers. The third point is on connectivity, and connectivity in general and mar uh, maritime connectivity in particular is a major linchpin of the strategies of almost, almost all countries that operate in the maritime reaches of Indo-Pacific. Connectivity, especially in the context of facilitating maritime trade, is a vital area of common interest. The Green Shipping Network, which is envisaged under the Quad construct, is dedicated to greening and decarbonizing the shipping value chain. And this is an example of collaborative uh, approach promoting a responsible connectivity in furtherance of global 
public goods. Such initiatives could be replicated by other groups of nations. When I refer to institutional connectivity, we should also think in terms of information sharing, building conduits of information, uh, specifically information on white shipping, maritime crime, and other such areas, including, uh, as mentioned, the underwater domain awareness. These are vital in en enhancing safety and security at sea. And when we look at the work that is being done by the IFC uh, information fusion centers, particularly in Singapore and India, we see advantages of connectivity. And there's potential for much greater collaboration, and we should devise methods to facilitate it. Uh, Dr. Bhuga brought about how we can connect all these MDA centers into something akin to a network of networks. And for that, we could leverage our sensors, technology, and most importantly, trust, as you mentioned. The last point I want to bring out is, uh, you know, increasingly uh, marine areas beyond national jurisdiction or ABNJs, commonly called the high seas, are likely to be in the focus because of over-exploitation over of resources as well as pollution. And these areas make up 64% of the surface of the ocean and nearly 95% of its volume. And because these areas are beyond any single nation's jurisdiction, sustainable resource management and preservation of biodiversity presents a huge challenge. There's this proposal of a global maritime accord which would work towards an action plan for safety, security, stability, and sustainability of areas beyond national jurisdiction. This has been mooted at New Delhi. Uh, I think countries in the Indo-Pacific could become champion nations in this initiative. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I'd like to submit that having identified the commonality of purpose or convergence, whichever way one chooses to look at, our common desire for security and well-being of our people, we must make it actionable. There are several challenges, such as divergent perceptions on key security issues, the intransigence of some in accepting a consensual uh, approach and the lack of capability and capacity amongst some important stakeholders in the region. However, these challenges must be overcome through a focused approach based on communication, connectivity, and networking. Connecting trade routes, infrastructure, institutions, and most importantly, people and ideas is sure to create a network that will support our vision of the Indo-Pacific. Thank you so much. Admiral Singh, sir, thank you very much uh, for your address. Uh, can I also say thank you for your uh, very complimentary comments regarding our Chief of Navy, Vice Admiral Noonan? and also Admiral Aquilino, uh, and also your own leadership in this area as Chief of Naval Staff, so thank you, sir. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Ms Jane Chan, uh, who is currently a Senior Fellow and Coordinator of the Maritime Security Program at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Jane is a Senior Fellow and Coordinator of the Maritime Security Program, and her main interests include maritime security issues in Southeast Asia, law and order at sea, regional maritime cooperation, and confidence building me measures, mm -hmm. as well as regional boundary delimitation and territorial disputes. She is an affiliated faculty at the Singapore Armed Forces. Ms Chan, I invite you to address the conference. Thank you very much, ma'am, for the introduction. A very good afternoon, one and all. A quick word of thanks, first and foremost, to the organizers for the very kind invitation um, and the very warm hospitality as well. Privileged to join this um, gathering of experts to share my thoughts and also very much looking forward to our discussion um, following the presentation. So we've heard the excellent uh, keynote by Professor Buger, bringing us through the evolution of the contention and the current debates Right, of interest to this particular panel. And panelists before me uh, have also left us with plenty of uh, food for thought. So I think it's best for me to concede now that I have nothing as profound to share. Um, but the plan, the plan, my, my plan really is to simply build on Prof. Buger's um, iteration of the contentions, right? And, and 
by adding the Southeast Asian context um, for our discussion later, and I'll do this in three broad um, dimensions. Yeah? First, to go broad by asking what is the most worrying trend uh, in the region, in, in Southeast Asia? Um, second, to dwell deeper into the regional context. And the question, is there a common vision um, on what the Southeast Asian maritime future should look like? Um, and third and final point, we'll touch on one of the specific questions that this panel um, was tasked to answer, which is um, what should be included under maritime security? What more should be included under maritime security? So onto the task at hand, what is the most worrying trend uh, when addressing the theme of this panel on a commonality of purpose? Um, I personally have long assumed that all maritime stakeholders agree on the following three propositions. Yeah? Um, one, our aspiration for peace at sea um, can only be achieved if we have rule of law. Two, in the maritime domain, the legal order is contained in UNCLOS, so we must therefore protect UNCLOS and not undermine it. And three, in the event of a dispute between states on the interpretation and application um, of the law, the dispute should be resolved peacefully um, and in accordance with international law. And if a dispute cannot be resolved through negotiation, um, then the parties should agree to refer the disputes to a binding third party mechanism. So what's the concern here, you may ask? On the first point on placing our aspiration for peace, safety and security on international rule of law, I question and I must say I'm worried about whether there is still a consensus on this. Right? Second, on the need to protect UNCLOS and not undermine it, there is perhaps where I'm mean, often confused by the differing positions um, taken. Hearing calls from regional countries, neighbours and friends, even partners who on the one hand talk about the upholding of the rule of law, but on the other call on the amendment on UNCLOS. So I've often wondered whether, whether there is a conflict here, right? I will ask the lawyer whether a unilateral call on amendment to UNCLOS is a way in, or is in a way challenging um, international law. Of course, we are all familiar with the long-held argument that you know, if we open up the prospect of amending UNCLOS, uh, we may never be able to reach a consensus to finalize the convention ever again. No doubt, the effectiveness of UNCLOS is often up for debate right, in the region and its provisions still sources of contention between states. Um, and there are many examples of non-compliance uh, by many states, right, including the uses and abuses of straight baseline, perceived illegal restrictions on freedom of navigation by coastal states, and the reluctance to acknowledge the rights and duties of user states in the exclusive economic zones. So one could also argue that the current um, tension between US and China has magnified the difference in interpretation and application of international law. So we see tensions between the interests of the coastal state on the one hand and those of maritime powers and users on the other. Of course, one may ask, if we are against amending UNCLOS, what can we do? We have lawyers much smarter than me in this conference to answer that question, but I suspect that you know, we may need a totally different conference to debate this. Um, third, on being ready to utilize the dispute settlement mechanisms, right? And this third proposition is perhaps where we will see the most disagreement or most reluctance even among major maritime power. So if these concerns are left unaddressed, will we be faced with a crisis? Or if, even if we take it down a notch, what are the risks at hand? Will it increase the risk of an incident and accident at sea? How about risk of an open conflict between um, disputing claimants? Or risk of an open military conflict uh, between the great powers? And the risk of an irreversible environmental degradation and the correlating uh, food security issue. On this point about environment, uh, food in particular, fish, you know, I would argue that we are almost already at the crisis stage, but I know that you know, many who disagree with me. So in my mind, this talk about crisis meant that some if not all of the crisis management safeguards, you know, which we are talking about, um, have failed one way or another, right? Hence, we have a crisis at hand. So for discussion purposes, let's, let's assume worst case scenario here, where all the prerequisites for effective risk management do not exist anymore. Trust for one, non-existence, right? The platform or, institutional, or institutions dysfunctional, um, zero information sharing. 
So if we are in agreement that we are not quite there yet, right? And then can we focus on work, working on these three key tenets, trust, institution, information sharing, to better manage a commonality of purpose? Now to dwell a little bit deeper into Southeast Asia, we all know that regional maritime security depends partly on global development and partly on local ones specific to Southeast Asia. And it's almost axiomatic that an inclusive maritime region founded upon international law and norms lay the foundation for safe and secure seas and that it is crucial for, regions, for the region's continued growth and prosperity. But even as friends and partners all emphasize the importance of maintaining a rules-based maritime order, in my view, it is rather clear that there is no common vision on what the Southeast Asian maritime future should look like. And this lack of common outlook meant that, you know, currently there is no alignment of priorities um, and less so on, on, on policy and strategy. So those with a vision uh, that is a, those who currently see the outlook as a competitive one will insist that the strategic environment is a zero-sum game and that it is currently dominated by great power rivalry and competition, right? So even when extra-regional powers extend their interest to cooperate with Southeast Asia, many are concerned that this could add complexity to ongoing um, U.S. Sino, uh, Sino U.S. rivalry. So challenges to the traditional freedoms of the seas arising from jurisdictional disputes about who and what, you know, about the jurisdiction and obligation of coastal states versus the rights and duties of user states, about environmental concern and the lax observation of laws, rules and regulations. And we see nation state forgetting that UNCLOS was a product of a grand bargain, right? One that was forged through very difficult compromises which we may not achieve again. So in this vision of the world, we can expect very little cooperation and a rather high risk of a fractured regional institution and that of conflict. Conversely, there is still a vision of a cooperative nature, yeah? reminding us that the success of our nations depends on seaborne trade and the globalized system that it leads to. Of course, still acknowledging that this system is under threat, it's just that it's not only because of great power competition. Right? Examples have already been, been mentioned, including the damaging effects of the various maritime security threats, such as piracy, um, armed robbery, smuggling, um, terrorism. So these threats to maritime security are well known, and the frequently raised questions and recommendations I think we all know by heart. Yeah? That being said, apart from recognizing just how important maritime security is, um, in nearly all countries, uh, balancing commitment and resources is a real challenge right now, uh, especially as we are slowly recovering from a global pandemic. So priority matters, yeah? So on top of that, the question remains whether um, cooperation on these maritime security issues uh, will lead to the spillover effect of alleviating the trust deficit in the region, right? That is much talked about and arguably one of the leading causes um, to the risk of conflict at sea. So a few words about cooperation and the institutions in Southeast Asia. I think one key criteria to move us um, towards positive cooperation and engagement is the need to be flexible. Right? One um, such aspect is to allow for various models. Right? Understanding partners' priority, ability, constraints is vital. So the question um, to this will be, do we understand each other well enough? You know, are we being flexible um, and accommodating? Are we being inclusive? So, in that sense, the question do remain, is there a habit of cooperation in Southeast Asia? The Emerald talk about there's a broader, there is in fact a broader, you know, um, um, habit of cooperation. But in Southeast Asia, I have a simple gauge that I use, right, whether we have a habit of, you know, um, sharing information. Because to me, information sharing is an important element um, to enhance the value of, of most, if not all, cooperative uh, mechanism that we have in mind and that it is imperative for risk management. The aim, of course, is um, transparency, yeah, the key element to confidence building. But can we really say that there's a disposition to share in the region that will allow for meaningful cooperation? I think there's a divergent range of um, cultural perspective to reckon with, and unfortunately, at least in my view, the need to know principle still remains dominant um, in the region. 
Of course, common sense will tell us that a lack of information sharing um, could distort what should have been a common maritime picture and in turn severely curtail our ability to manage and mitigate risk. So moving on to the third aspect of my remarks today, um, to address the prescribed question on what should be included um, under maritime security. And I find it um, particularly useful to link it to another question that we were given, which is um, on how might these challenges um, be interlinked. But instead of advocating for a specific issue um, such as climate change uh, to be included under the ambit of maritime security, um, I will simply illustrate the point on why I found it impossible to delink many of the challenges from the maritime security discussion. And since the topic on climate change and sea level rise is really not my area of expertise, right? I, I would just want to highlight um, one of the angles, right, the, um, that maritime security analysts might, like myself are looking at and that it is the legal implication on the law of the sea, especially on the provisions um, with reference to sovereignty and sovereign rights of the states, entitlements of these states, um, these island states, and the correlating uh, enforcement issues at, uh, at sea. So policymakers and academics alike are looking into how states would defend their existing territories and uh, marine resources in accordance with international law um, when dealing with rising um, sea and land loss. Of course, most are thinking about the existential threat, right? The existential question for this um, country and their people about whether, you know, statehood can continue if nation were to become uninhabitable and, and legal rights and implications um, for citizen mobility if people are relocated. No doubt, some of this impact um, won't be felt immediately, but nonetheless need to be discussed now. To some, it may be futile, right, to discuss hypothetical of yet to be displaced people, um, but the issue of migration, legal or otherwise, will become even uh, will become real, even before islands and atoll become underwater features. Yeah, so it will also be difficult to ignore the more immediate problem of changes in uh, fishing resources, a food security uh, problem with shifts in species distribution or some facing total wipeout, um, which has challenged international and national um, oceans and fishery governance. So I'll end my presentation here and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Chen. I think you're a little bit humble in your comments about not being added to the debate. And I hope the audience is starting to understand the diversity of our uh, panellists here today. Uh, for our final presenter, it's my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor David Letts, who is the Director of the Military Law Program and Director of the Centre for Military and Security Law at the ANU College of Law here in Canberra, Australia. His research interests centre upon the application of legal regimes to military operations, and he has written on topics including military justice, law of the sea, the law of naval warfare, international humanitarian law, and the legal issues which arise on peacekeeping operations. I would also note that he served for some three decades in the Navy. Professor Letts, I invite you to address the conference. Thank you very much, Admiral Malcolm. And, um I'm also grateful to the Sea Power Centre, Captain Andrews and the RAN for uh, inviting me uh, along here today to join this excellent panel. Um, as the last speaker for the day and, and another lawyer um, put at the end of the panel, unusually there's already a question for me appearing here. I've said nothing other than my name and somebody's decided that uh, I, I already need to answer a question. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to build on... Um, Caroline's uh, presentation from the previous session, as well as some of the comments from my other panellists um, uh, this afternoon. And um, on the notes that I've got in front of me, I've written out maritime security, a commonality of purpose with a question mark. And that's deliberate. And uh, the title that I'm giving this is Scoping Some Legal Issues. I want to look at... Um, a little bit more about what is maritime security and where does it fit within a broader remit of international security? What do we know and understand by this? I want to look at the legal frameworks that exist um, for both and then pick up some regional issues that I'll link 
to the Law of the Sea Convention that you've heard so much about and leave you with some concluding thoughts that um, might give scope for many of the countries represented here to try and uh, progress some issues in, um, in this area and what could be a very complex and difficult area. So first of all, just thinking a little bit about what we've been talking about, a purpose of uh, international conflict and security law of which maritime security law fits within and the, and the wider scope of maritime security fits within. And let me just give you a list from a, a colleague of mine at Nottingham University, Professor Nigel White, writing in 2014, he said, the purpose of international conflict and security law uh, addresses things like arms control, limits the resort to force by states, limits private violence, tackles existential threats, it collectivises security, limits the effects of warfare, ensures post-conflict transition from war to peace, and ultimately protects peace and justice. And if you think about what's going on around the world at the moment in various regions, I think each one of those purposes is being challenged at the moment by various states. In terms of maritime security, it sits within an international legal framework, but it's not the only element of maritime security, as you've heard from, from Christian and others um, earlier this afternoon. We did a, uh, a little project uh, at the end of last year um, uh, under Jane's uh, leadership, and we looked at conceptualisations of maritime security in Southeast Asia. And there was about 11 states plus ASEAN that we looked at, and one of the starting points that we looked at was, is there an official definition of maritime security? And two of the states and ASEAN, uh, the answer was yes. For every other state, including Australia, there was no um, official de definition for maritime security. And I, I did the paper for Australia and made the note that a search of relevant government publications, of which I looked at quite a list, doesn't provide any evidence of an official definition for maritime security adopted by the Australian government. But a range of Australian government departments and authorities use the term invariably without an accompanying definition. And my conclusion at looking at that element of maritime security was that it, it um, was useful for Australian government authorities to not have an easily obtainable definition and, and to, to not have consensus across departments as to the definitional boundaries of the term. And instead, the way in which it was used could depend upon who was using the term. And I picked up two um, focus, if you like. One, which was a macro focus, which was largely external, and Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, along with the Department of Defence, really had the scope on that. But then there was also a micro component as well that the Department of Home Affairs and the Australian Border Force with a large number of supporting agencies found uh, was useful for their purposes uh, as well. So no key definition um, for Australia or no widely accepted definition, but from a maritime security law perspective, the international legal framework comprises treaties as well as customary international law and very importantly, state practice. <clears throat> and then if you look at the concepts that make up uh, maritime security, um, part of it is dealing with the meaning of maritime security, but the other part is very importantly the relationship with the law of the sea. And I'm going to say something about that um, in a minute or two. Other academic colleagues who have written on this topic um, have made the, uh, the point that uh, the different meaning can depend on, on who is using the term in the context. And some others, colleagues who I'll see next week, um, have suggested that a stable order of the oceans subject to the rule of law at sea is sufficient to describe maritime security. They go on to say, this is my friends um, Kraska and Pedroso from the US Naval War College, that maritime security operations, when you get it down and operationalise what you're talking about, 
lie at the uncomfortable nexus between maritime law enforcement and the law of naval warfare, and we've already had some concept, uh, uh, comments about that this afternoon as well. I'd like to also briefly mention the rules-based international order, or the international rules-based order, or however you choose to describe it, and to say um, that this is not the same as international law either. Um, it's a wider concept of which international law um, picks up elements uh, of it. But it includes treaty law that I talked about. It includes customary international law and state practice. It also includes soft law, non-binding instruments, informal agreements, and other actions between um, agencies. And so that term is one that uh, also uh, has different meanings for different pur uh, purposes depending on who's using um, the meaning. In, um, and another colleague has re recently written a paper about this, literally just published last week, uh, Natalie Klein. And, and Natalie has said that Australian governments have typically defined the rules-based um, order under uh, sorry, expansively to encompass a broad architecture of international governance which has developed since the end of the Second World War. And I think we've heard that yesterday and today with, with reference to the international rules-based order, um, but perhaps not the specificity of exactly what it's uh, covering at any um, particular time. So where does that leave us with maritime security law and a definition of it? Well, some of the things that it provides, without perhaps having a clear definition, is a legal authority to counter the threats and dangers that affect sovereignty and sovereign rights of all states in the maritime domain. Maritime security law is primarily, but not exclusively, based on international law. There are some elements of domestic law that may be relevant, particularly close to the uh, coastal states' coastlines. The key document is undoubtedly the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but I'll say some more about that in a minute. And there's also, though, been an exponential growth in other ways of maritime regulation through a variety of other treaties, and in particular, the um, series of treaties dealing with suppression of unlawful activities uh, at sea. Now, 40 years ago, or nearly 40 years ago, in December 1982, the final signature, uh, as Jane has mentioned, after nearly 10 years of negotiation, the final signature uh, was and final conference was held that resulted in what we now know as the 1982 Law of the Sea Conference. In January earlier this year, 40 years ago, Midshipman Letts walked through the doors of the Naval College and I was speaking with Admiral Barry at lunch and, and he asked me, well, which do you think is in better shape? You or the Law of the Sea Convention? And I said, I'm not sure, Admiral. I think they might both have their problems and faults at the moment. But I'm going to suggest that there are some friction points and some problems with the Law of the Sea Convention that can really be rectified without too much difficulty through the sort of dialogue we've been talking about for most of today. Just a couple of reminders of some of the basic, some of the basic tensions. There's the mare liberum, mare clausum argument. This is the South China Sea wrapped up in a ball. And for those of you who don't remember your Latin from school, open or closed seas. Which one is it? What do we want and what do we aspire to? And most in this room, I think, will say the open seas is going to be um, where we're at. And remember, the freedoms that, have see, that existed prior to the convention um, being signed in 1982, and then taking nearly another 12 years to enter into force as well. And so my second point there in a sort of law of the sea basics is that there's a lack of agreement on key law of the sea issues up until 1982. Even something now that we think is fundamental, like the maximum breadth of a territorial sea being up to 12 nautical miles. Um, the Law of the Sea Convention, the 1982 Convention, its main features, though, are those that some, uh, many of you in the room would well and truly know. It set up navigational or consolidated navigational regimes. It introduced some new ones, and it set up a, a, and consolidated a series of zones from the four 1958 conventions. 
the basic zones, internal waters, territorial sea, contiguous zone, exclusive economic zone, and then the continental shelf extending beyond that in certain circumstances. New regimes were introduced, importantly in our region. The exclusive economic zone was introduced as a new regime, and so was the regime that deals with archipelagic states. There had been agitation throughout the 1960s and 1970s for that, um, that regime to be introduced, and it was. Importantly, the Law of the Sea Convention is a package deal, as we've just heard, and in fact, Ambassador Koh, of course, from Singapore, was instrumental in bringing together in those last few years. But it does have friction points. Um, the main friction points relate to different interpretations in relation to some very fundamental issues. The drawing of baselines, passage rights in maritime zones, especially passage rights that affect warships, coastal state rights and obligations in the various maritime zones. The coastal state does not have sovereignty over all of those zones. They certainly have uh, sovereignty over internal waters, territorial sea and archipelagic waters, but the coastal state has sovereign rights the further out you go. Warship activities um, in various zones, uh, the territorial sea and the EEZ, and I want to say a little bit about dispute resolution, which Jane has um, talked about. Okay, so let's just quickly look at a couple of states. So I'm going to quickly say something about Australia. Australia talks about um, adherence to the rules-based order, and yet Australia has used and tried to use the um, law of the sea mechanisms to avoid some of its um, obligations under the law of the sea convention most recently uh, in the dispute that it had with Timor-Leste. It used, Australia used the full extent of the law that was available to it, argued the toss, eventually lost, and then accepted the umpire's result and got on, on with it and we ended up with a treaty um, with uh, Timor-Leste. Um, that was unlikely to have occurred five years ago if you asked anyone, but it did occur a, a couple of years ago. Let's talk about the USA and it not being party to the 1982 convention. Admiral, Admiral Paparo yesterday referred to the 1982 convention, but of course the US officially talks about um, the law of the sea as represented by the 1982 convention because the US isn't party. The reasons that the US is not party has got nothing to do with consecutive administrations since, um, Admiral Re uh, sorry, since President Reagan's time. Um, perhaps President Trump's administration may not have been so enthusiastic as an international law treaty. Um, but the military have consistently said that they want to be party to it. What does not being party to the convention mean to the USA? Well, it gives China a free kick at them every time they say something about what China's doing in the region. But also it means that the US is excluded from part 15 and that's the, the dispute settlement regime that exists under the Law of the Sea Convention, which we've seen states such as Russia and China so flagrantly um, flaunt in, um, blatantly flaunt in, in the last few years. And then finally, um, let me say something about China. China's presence in the South China Sea on certain maritime features presents challenges to navigation and overflight that are not contemplated by the Law of the Sea Convention. It also raises resource issues in contested waters. We've heard earlier this afternoon that China has introduced domestic laws through its new Coast Guard law um, that are inconsistent with obligations that exist under international law. It uses its maritime militia and grey zone tactics in ways that again are tried to ob obfuscate and are inconsistent with international law. China is, of course, party to the convention. However, it steadfastly refused to be involved in the 2016 arbitration with the Philippines, um, and yet again used some obscure tactics to attack the arbitral tribunal under those compulsory dispute settlement um, measures under part 15 of the convention. And afterwards, of course, it uh, uh, refused to acknowledge the, uh, the arbitration and the award at all. 
And then the other thing that China consistently does is try to change the narrative through multiple channels, for those of you who do advertising um, work. The nine dash line, whatever that means, they don't say. Official statements that repudiate other statements, such as Australia's note verbal that we put out uh, in relation to Malaysia's um, continental shelf claim. Um, and also through academic um, papers that, that uh, simply don't adequately reflect what the 1982 Convention says. So I'll stop there because there may be some questions that arise um, out of uh, some of that. I thank you for your time and, uh, and uh, welcome your uh, questions and comments. Uh, thanks, uh, panellists. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those of us that haven't um, been in the auditorium all morning, um, the way to ask a question is via the um, IP22 app. So, as we are going through the process of asking the panellists questions, if you've got a, one, then uh, please make sure you submit it that way. Uh, so, the first question uh, is actually there for uh, Dr. Buger. And that question is, how is evolution of maritime security as a concept likely to affect practice? For example, how will states secure the blue economy? How will states defend against non-state actors at sea? And what will be the best use of naval power at sea? A nice and easy one for you, sir. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the question. It's quite obviously a very, uh, very broad, uh, broad one. Perhaps it's good to start in thinking about why does it matter how we conceptualize maritime security? Why does it matter what we write in maritime security strategies uh, and, and so on? Well, the answer is because it defines our priorities, our investment strategies, uh, what we're doing with our capabilities, and uh, what kind of forward-looking programs uh, we are designing. In going through this evolution of, uh, of maritime security, uh, there's is, is also a story about different priorities. So we started with piracy and terrorism, and we ended up with geopolitics. That is somewhat puzzling. And perhaps also to comment a little bit on the, uh, on the panel, I think we should be cautious when we're talking about maritime security to reduce that debate only to the states, both in terms of the threats, because many of the threats are non-state threats, or if we're looking at uh, uh, entities such as the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, hybrid uh, threats. But then also it is not only states that do have an interest in maritime security. It is also the shipping industry, it's the extractive industry, it is also the super rich that want to sail their super yachts. <laughs> right. It's the divers, it's the nature lovers, uh, and, uh, and so on. And this we clearly should consider in our discussion because it's not only what is being decided in, in governments. It also matters what happens in parliament. It also happens, uh, matters what, uh, what kind of uh, self-regulative measures the industry takes uh, and so on. And saying that, that it's important to take this broader uh, view beyond the state uh, then also allows us much better to integrate these other uh, concerns, the blue economy concerns, the environmental concerns, the ocean health concerns, and uh, the concerns over the justice of coastal populations. And that is basically at the heart of what I was uh, suggesting in terms of bringing maritime security back to ocean governance. And I heard some pessimism in the, uh, in the table here. Let me also kind of like add a little bit of more optimism towards it. And for me, one, one of the brightest moments in, in recent, uh, recent history, there was not a lot, but just two weeks after the uh, Ukraine uh, invasion started, uh, the UN Environmental Assembly agreed on negotiating a new treaty, a new treaty to fight plastic 
waste and uh, do something about plastic pollutions in the oceans. So this, I think, uh, is an event that could still give us some hope, both in terms of new law, but also commonality in, uh, in doing uh, something about such problems. Thank you, sir. So the next question is actually for the entire panel. So Professor Letts, if I could ask you to answer this question first, and then if we can just work along the panel after that. And the question is, how might freedom of navigation laws need to change in order that the states might better assure maritime security? Sure. Um, thank you uh, for the question. And um, my easy answer is I don't think the freedom of navigation laws need to change at all. I think the, the concept of freedom of navigation ever since Grotius uh, wrote in the early 1600s is, is one that the, that the global community, community widely embraces. What we do, and, and, and is adequately reflected in the 1982 convention, and it's also reflected for those states that aren't party in customary international law. The very first case that went before the International Court of Justice was a freedom of navigation case involving UK and Albania, the Corfu Channel case, um, and, and the principles that warships enjoy um, freedom of navigation uh, in the same way that merchant vessels do has been around for a long time, reflected in the 1958 conventions and the 1982 convention. What we do have, though, are interpretations. So the Law of the Sea Convention, as I think Jane mentioned, is, is a package deal. You sign up to the lot. You don't get the chance, like with some conventions, to say, oh, I like all those 320 articles except Article 24. That doesn't do it for me, so I'm not bound by Article 24. That's not the way the Law of the Sea Convention works. You have to take it all, which is one of the reasons why America, the United States of America, didn't sign up to the convention in 1982. Um, so what can we do about this um, with, with freedom of navigation? Where I was going to get to with my concluding remarks is that the different interpretations that states in our regions have about military activities in either the exclusive economic zone or uh, passage rights of, of warships through uh, the territorial sea in particular. I think there's room to work there. You don't have to change the convention. This, I agree with Jane. This is not going to be unpacked after 10 years of negotiation. There's 168 states who have signed up to this convention. It's very widely, widely signed and ratified. But I think there is some dialogue, some very useful dialogue that can be had about military activities in the EEZ, the different understandings of states. And if, if states in our region can, uh, a lot of states, like-minded states, can get to a place where, where they get a commonality of understanding there, um, that perhaps put, puts pressure on other states, um, such as China, that um, purports to put restrictions on both vessels and um, aircraft operating in areas like the South China Sea. So I think that's some useful work that really could be done amongst states to get that sort of commonality. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. I, I will fully agree with um, Prof Letts on this because when I'm thinking about maritime security challenge in Southeast Asian waters, for example, and vis-a-vis and, and -vis freedom of navigation, I see two dimensions. First, of course, is um, the commercial shipping. Is there a threat to commercial shipping? And when it comes to threats and challenges commercial shipping, most of these arise from a non-state actor, right? So the, the blue crimes, as, as Prof um, Bugel will refer to, to them. So in that sense, you know, um, freedom of navigation to commercial shipping, white shipping is, is unimpeded so far. But you know, the, the real problem is indeed, as, as Prof. Lett mentioned, uh, military activities at the different maritime zone, and that seemed to be rather problematic in the Southeast Asian context um, so far. Thank you. That's a uh, tricky question, actually. Uh, you know, it's all about uh, building trust. Uh, when uh, the UNCLOS was signed, there were submissions made on certain issues by several countries. And uh, if the countries believe strongly in the freedom of navigation, which we should, uh, we need to 
be sensitive, build trust, and uh, perhaps avoid uh, confrontations as far as possible. Take a look at whether it's worth the, uh, the kind of uh, actions that you wish to take. And if you feel that, yes, the, the, there is, in certain states, this flagrant uh, violation uh, to not only the freedom of navigation, but a larger issue of UNCLOS, then go ahead by all means and do freedom of navigation exercises, etc. But I think it needs a little bit of rational thinking on how much you want to push this envelope. Uh, there are several countries who have uh, submitted, uh, they, you know, they made submissions on issues of prior notification or prior information or military exercises in EZ. I think it needs uh, a little bit of discussion on part of, or a little bit of analysis and uh, perhaps if you want to confront, then you do so with, a, with an open mind and after having given due consideration. I think that's my submission. Uh, just a short response, and I'll refer back to um, Associate Professor Letts, who said uh, there's law and then there's their interpretations. And I think I, the real question is, what are the interpretations of the freedom of navigation <laughs> And um, you know, understanding how countries um, interpret those, given their histories, contexts, et cetera, um, will then help us answer how then can states better assure their maritime security. Let me flip it a little bit around. I think the key question here is how do we get better at restricting freedom of navigation? And let's not forget, UNCLOS is not the only uh, legal apparatus uh, that actually uh, regulates freedom of navigation. We also have uh, counter-terrorism uh, provisions. We also have uh, transnational organized crime conventions. And above all, also uh, a series of environmental uh, conventions. So restricting freedom of navigation here, we need to talk about uh, you know, our, our flag state provisions apt to do something about smuggling, illegal fishing? Do we have the right in environmental laws in place to, to ensure that there's uh, no pollution taking place, that uh, the shipping industry indeed cuts down its uh, CO2 emissions? Let's not forget shipping is one of the main polluters. These are also all freedom of navigation uh, issues in the end. Uh, they are a question of what kind of ships do we want to see on our waters and what do they do for the, uh, to, to the oceans and the, the environment. That is part of maritime security too. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess just to, just to ask another question back to Professor Letts. Um, if we look at sometimes that the law does take a long time to be put in place, um, what are our thoughts about being able to put in a regional framework that addresses things like grey zone activities and autonomous uh, vessels. And I'm, I'm interested in how you think we might approach that. I'm, uh, I'm a bit reluctant to um, over-regulate some of these areas because I think the regulation that, that's provided, the framework that's provided by the Law of the Sea Convention is, um, is quite clear. The negotiating history is quite clear. The um, the, the long heritage of the law of the sea, um, to me, is quite clear. Um, th th there are different interpretations and declarations that have been made in some areas, including, as I said, by states in our, in our region um, about uh, the things we've just been talking about. But I, I don't think that the convention itself is, is at fault. I think it's the, the way that states have either not engaged, and I agree with Admiral Singh, states uh, th that... Um, States should be able to look at this and, and say, well, why do you want to interpret in this way? And, and, and have, have a, um, a respectful and robust conversation about that and see if there's some areas of commonality that can then um, uh, be reached. And in particular, if there's you know, little bits, the low-hanging fruit, if you like, that can be picked off um, and then presented in a coordinated manner in the region to those states that say are clearly um, acting contrary to what the convention says through improperly drawn 
baselines, for example, that just simply don't conform with the convention. We saw the example uh, earlier today about the um, straight baselines around um, Paracel Islands. They simply don't, they're, they're not permitted. In fact, one of the things the United States has done is limits in the seas. It's a series it puts out. Number 150 mm -hmm. um, assesses state practice including some of Australia's state, state practice, and it says there's no support for this um, in, in a very comprehensive and, and um, carefully anal analytical manner. So you've got a country that's you know, not party of the convention, but then takes these, as a matter of customary law, these issues very seriously. So, so I, think, I think there's dialogue that's needed, but I don't think it's dialogue that looks, looks at unpacking the convention, because I think that, that's just, it was too hard to get it put together for what it is. There, there are, there's an implementing agreement which, which solved the United States problems with the deep seabed. They've got internal issues that prevent them signing up. Well, that can be solved in some other way, not by us. But, um, but I think the convention's a very um, robust document that, that adequately covers um, the issues that arise at sea. You now need to get, and working on it for a long time, this some, some sort of more, some more commonality between understanding, states' understanding, and states' behaviours too. Thanks, sir. The next question is directed to Professor Rubley, and that is, what do you see as the long-term implications of the china Solomon Security Pact? Well, we could probably have a whole conference just on that. <laughs> so I will limit my response to just sort of three short sort of initial thoughts. The first is, um, this is probably, even though it's not called the base, it's going to evolve into something like a base, just like we've seen at the Horn of Africa. Um, unfortunately, I just, it's pessimistic, but I just think that's the way it's probably going, going to go. I think more importantly, a long term, what are the long term implications going to be depends upon Australia's response and response by others in the region. You know, I've heard people say, for example, Australia needs to be withdrawing all aid. And Australia it does provide significant maritime support to the Solomon Islands, and that should be withdrawn because we're just making it easier for them. And actually, I think that's really the wrong way to go. The long-term implications of that would only be to further cement and make it, um, you know, make not just Solomon Islands, but other countries in the region feel much more concerned about the credibility of Australian commitment to the region. And then I think hopefully the, on, another long-term um, implication will be that Australia and other countries in the region will start paying much closer attention to all states, not just great powers, because this is, you know, the second time we've had something like this sort of catch us by surprise with China. And, um, you know, we've, we've got to, as, as the ambassador said, and as people have said throughout the conference, you know, be looking at um, all of the partners in the region and what do they care about and why do they care about it and how can we bring countries together for this commonality of purpose, or I think we should say purposes because there will be many, to make them interested in the things, um, you know, the partnerships that we want with them. Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. The next question is for Professor Letts, and that question is, given China refuses to participate in UNCLOS arbitration, would US ratification provide a useful avenue to curtail China's excessive claims? And if so, how? Um, thank you for that question. I'll, I'll go back to what, what I um, said earlier about, about the US. For those of you who've worked with um, US Navy and US Navy JAGs in particular, they know the 1982 convention backwards. The, the, it's operative parts of the convention um, ever since President Reagan made his statement in 1983 that, that America recognises those operative parts um, as uh, binding on it as, as a matter of customary international law. So, so that's some of the argument that people in America make about why there's no need for America to sign up to the convention. Um, but as I also indicated, the convention, when I checked it again late last night, uh, 168 states parties. Um, and the United States is a notable absentee. The United States was heavily involved in the negotiation um, for the convention, but because of the deep seabed mining regime and, and the area, as it's called, they, they refused to sign at the time. That's been fixed. And so you've had testimony going back to Admiral Mullen's time, Admiral Ruffhead's time, um, Admiral Clark before that, before Admiral Mullen, 
the Chiefs of Naval Operations of America, the Secretaries of States, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs have, have all testified before Congress. There's a big testimony in 2007, 8, another one in 2012 with Hillary Clinton. Administrations and the military want America to be signed up to the 1982 Convention because they say, um, you know, they're, they're um, abiding by it anyway. And so, um, but as I also mentioned, one of the things that, that by not being party to the Convention, America's got nowhere to go, for example, to the dispute resolution body that's set up specifically under the Convention, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. They don't get, it, they don't get to go there. And nor do others get to resolve their disputes with America, other states, through the dispute settlement mechanisms that are there under Part 15. So that's a, that, that, that's a clear detriment to America, I think, um, by not being party. Now, what would that mean um, in relation to China's refusal to participate in that uh, award, uh, uh, proceedings with the Philippines? Well, it would obviously give America some leverage to be able to say, well, you know, here's what this package means. You don't get to pick and choose which bits you can be part of and which you can't. Whereas at the moment, China can say and does say to America, don't you go lecturing us about law of the sea. You're not even party to this convention. And so that's, as I described it, that's just a free kick that China gets um, at America that could really disappear except for some internal political issues that America's got in relation to international treaties. So that's, that's my answer to that. It, it, it would advantage considerably America to be able to respond to those types of um, comebacks, if you like, from China. Thanks, Prof. So, Admiral Singh, the next question is all yours, and that is, amongst all the things which we might do, what must Australia and India do to improve maritime competence? and maritime domain awareness so as to secure the good order, which is our common purpose. Thank you for this question. Uh, in fact, uh, this has been uh, on our minds uh, of uh, both leaderships, uh, Indian Navy and Royal Australian Navy, uh, both these points on how to improve uh, the maritime competence and the maritime domain. Um, in fact, we went beyond and uh, looked at collective maritime competence and how, how could we, uh, when we look at uh, uh, capacity building and uh, capability enhancement, how do we work together uh, with various countries in the region uh, and align our efforts rather than working at cross purposes. And uh, this has engaged us and we worked on this and we produced a, a roadmap uh, in, which covers some of these issues. And uh, as far as uh, maritime domain awareness is concerned, there's been a lot of improvement. Uh, you know, you start with uh, white shipping, then you proceed to gray, then you go into black shipping, you go into underwater domain awareness. All these are on the table. They're being discussed uh, under the, uh, the uh, bilateral plus the multilateral or uh, the quad uh, umbrella. And I think uh, this is the way to go. Uh, and we are two countries which have got the uh, uh, enough capacity to work together and make a difference. We cannot, and uh, like I said, this is the middle powers that have to do heavy lifting. And I consider both Australia and India to be middle powers. And, uh, we can do much more, and we are trying to do much more. We've done a lot of discussions on this. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is for Jane, and that is, how might law be reformed to accommodate contested maritime boundaries in the region? Is reform of the law enough? Well, in my view, it's not an issue about whether we reform the law or not. I think I'm, I'm with Prof. Let. On, on that issue is that, you know, it's, it's not about the law in itself right now, it's about the inconsistent interpretation of the law and the inconsistent application um, of the law. So if we look at the contested boundary issue in the South China Sea right now, um, in, in my mind, you know, we should look at this from three dimensions, right? Um, first and foremost, from the, um, from the perspective of the claimants themselves, Right. So amongst the claimants and when it comes to the territorial disputes, it's really up to the, the, the claimants um, to negotiate 
And when you're negotiating boundaries behind closed door, the law may not need to come into the fall. It's up to the countries to negotiate that. But the second dimension is about you know, um, ASEAN and China. So despite you know, the, the territorial disputes in the South China Sea, we do still have the broader maritime security challenges that you know, Prof. Buger talked about. And that is where you know, ASEAN and China will need to cooperate on to ensure that we can manage these maritime security challenges. And with that, you know, um, then the law would, would have some guiding principles in terms of how we can um, engender some of these cooperative um, uh, initiatives and, and practical mechanisms. But the third dimension is where I often argue that the disputes, the, the, the complex territorial and maritime disputes in the South China Sea is no, or, or more like the problem in the South China Sea is no longer only about the complex territorial and maritime disputes. In my mind, it is about the universality of laws, rules, and principles. And this is where you know, stakeholders lies beyond this Office Asia. This is where stakeholders, as Prof. Buger is mentioning, you know, everybody has a stake in it. Every country that applies to regional water has a stake in ensuring that laws and rules are, are, are based on universal interpretation and consistent application. So in that sense, you know, um, I will not draw the correlation to how do we deal with the dispute per se on whether you know, um, changing of the law would, would help in that manner. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Uh, the next question is for the entire panel, um, and I might start at the opposite end this time. So Dr. Fugu, if I could ask for you to answer this one first. <coughs> Um, and the question is, how might the Indo-Pacific nations deal more constructively with the problem of illegal fishing? Yeah, um, the easy answer is perhaps eat less fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. The <laughs> more complex answer is that, first of all, there are different layers of uh, uh, illicit fishing activities. I personally don't, don't prefer the IUU label because it's relatively ambitious and uh, uh, ambiguous. And what we actually uh, need to be concerned about are all these fishing activities that cause harm, right? Hence illicit rather than illegal or unregulated or unreported. So that's the first, uh, first thing. The second one is, uh, this takes place at uh, different levels. The first one is smaller coastal um, illicit fishing activities the second one is uh, illicit fishing activities by international criminal gangs. And the third one then is illicit fishing activities which are in one way or the other state sponsored or at least state tolerated. And all of that is going on in the, uh, in the Pacific and uh, as elsewhere. But I think for these three different forms of illicit fishing we also need to have three different approaches. Maritime domain awareness and information sharing, I think, is uh, crucial. It's also very important, actually, to, uh, to build appropriate regimes for fishery control and inspections. In many countries, in exclusive economic zones, the fishing licenses uh, are actually the problem and the corruption linked uh, to, to, to the licenses. So that would be a, a place uh, not only to start, but where we have to get uh, better. And then if it comes to the state sponsored or state tolerated, uh, I think it is also uh, about uh, building up international pressure. And that is pressure towards the European Union, that it's pressure towards uh, China, it's pressure towards Iran, if we are uh, also including the Western Indian Ocean uh, in our understanding of the Indo-Pacific, and it's perhaps also pressure uh, that should come from us as consumers to insist that what we're going to eat tonight is not sourced through illicit fishing activities. So let, let's not forget about uh, that either. Well, that was extremely thorough. <laughs> I would say I, I think all of that is, is the case. Um, I think for me, one of the most important things is to work on, you know, what do we mean by illegal or illicit fishing? And, um, 
you know, it seems pretty basic, but actually, you know, when we hear, um, you know, Christian talk about, you know, part of the problem is, is corruption with licenses. And, um, and so understanding and sort of, I'm thinking of studying, you know, what the, what the problems are that lead to this type of um, illicit fishing that causes harm, that really we've got to have that if we want to be able to think about policies that will then be able to fix or ameliorate that. When you want to look at this uh, IUU fishing, I think if you want to analyze it, first of all, you have to analyze it thoroughly. All implications, all the reasons that uh, have led to this kind of uh, fishing. I mean, there are so many uh, different facets to IUU fishing. I, I'll give you an example of our uh, fishermen going and, uh, you know, with the, the problem that we are facing with Sri Lanka. Uh, it is an issue of uh, the closeness of the border, or the, the IMBL or the uh, maritime boundary line, the kind of fishing that they do, uh, destructive, environmentally destructive fishing, and therefore, what does one do? So, uh, to, to that problem, the answer is that get them more engaged, uh, give them, uh, uh, you know, uh, concessions on deep sea fishing, and convert them from fishermen who are doing environmentally damage, uh, damaging fishing to deep sea fishing. And uh, that would uh, solve the problem with, of uh, one of the problems, for example, with Sri Lanka. But I think uh, once you analyze this, first to analyze it, you require <clears throat> awareness and understanding of what is going on around you. And uh, this again comes to the problem of uh, capacities, uh, not, uh, not only for awareness, but after that, uh, to uh, management issues and, of course, enforcement. So there's one, to provide alternatives. Second, to have a good awareness on what is going on. Uh, in, in improve awareness in other nations around you, smaller nations, uh, in terms of uh, capabilities on how they're going to formulate their national laws to uh, derive the maximum benefit of the UNCLOS and things like that. Uh, improve their ability to police uh, the areas around them. Uh, there are the uh, islands have huge EZs, about 1,000 times their uh, land, land area. And that is where uh, the middle powers or other countries who must engage with these smaller uh, nations, give them the capacities. Uh, in fact, uh, do some heavy lifting by going there and uh, actually providing your assets till the time their assets uh, uh, are made. And what we do with Seychelles and uh, Mauritius is we go there, embark their law enforcement uh, agencies, and then do the patrolling for them. So these are some issues that we'll have to uh, handle till such time, uh, you know, the entire uh, global mechanism or something is put in place. Uh, but uh, till then, we'll have to take each problem and uh, attack it piecemeal, whilst parallelly uh, understanding the larger uh, implications and larger uh, analyzing the larger impact of IUU. I must say that I agree with the MRO here because you know, in, in just looking at this question, we use two shorthands here, right? Indo-Pacific nations for one and IUU fishing. But just this morning, I've, I've learned um, from the experts looking at the IUU problem in a, a sideline event that the characteristics of IUU is rather different in the, very, in the various sub-regions within the Indo-Pacific. So in that sense, right, I fully agree with you know, the Amaro's suggestion that it really needs to be bespoke in that sense. Thank you. Um, Christian, after ordering 10 different types of herring in Copenhagen a few years ago, I can assure you eating less herring would solve one problem. That was an error my wife and I made when we were last up there. Um, look, here's what Australia did about 25 years ago. We had a lot of IUU fishing down south. We threw assets at it. The government said, um, we're going to stop this. The Navy was tasked because we had the vessels to do it. Um, we went down south into the sub-Antarctic fisheries and uh, we apprehended vessels that were pinching um, Patagonian toothfish as they were known, or Chilean sea bass. Um, 
we undertook two of the uh, longest hot pursuits, about six knots, eight knots. It's not that hot, but um, it was a pursuit. One, um, was, uh, one vessel was apprehended off the uh, coast of South Africa using South African um, naval vessels to take some of our people who we'd flown over with some certain kit to apprehend that vessel. We sailed it back to Fremantle and prosecuted the crew. And we had a longer one um, the year after. And um, in a previous life, I was the fleet lawyer when we did all that, and it was good fun sort of working it all out. So enforcement, as you mentioned, Admiral, having the assets to do it, having the will to go through and make sure we got the apprehension done. The second one was even longer. The vessel was out in the South Atlantic, and we had to get the British to help us with their vessel from the Falklands and so on. So long, hot pursuits, and we followed through with it. The other thing that Australia has done, and, and I know other states around the world has done, so we've got an agreement with France in, um, down around Heard and, Heard and McDonald Islands and Kerguelen Islands, where we can both do some patrolling on behalf of each other and, and, and authorise, uh, authorise to take um, action in relation to vessels that are there. So there's a number of different things, but it's a resolve to, to solve the problem amongst the states, along with the capacity that the Admiral mentioned as well. Um, and, and seen it through. Thanks, Professor. So we have one last question, and it's actually for everybody as well. Um, I might ask you, Professor, to kick off, please, and if you wouldn't mind, Professor Letts, and the question is for the futures of... Oh, that, that's for the international relations... You don't want to touch it? You don't want to touch it for me? OK, all right. Well, we'll go down this end, then. Dr Buger, would you mind uh, addressing this no, one no, first? I, I, I can do it. Look, um, Y yes, um, we're I'll talking... I'll just ask the question first, so just give me two oh, seconds. Sorry. So for the audience, the question is, for the future of oceans governance, are we talking about law, norms, order, or simply the realist balance of power? Thanks, and Professor, over to you. My answer to that is E, all of the above. It really, it really is. It's a combination of all of those things. You, you, I, I think this panel has made it clear that you can't isolate um, any of these um, issues they're all going to be there because that's the way states behave. So, so a little bit flippant, but I think it's a combination of all of those things. If you take any of them in isolation, you won't get the solution that, um, uh, that you're looking for. Indeed, I mean, in, in a way, when we are talking about laws, rules and regulation, which I mentioned a lot in, in my presentation and the concerns, the correlating concerns that I mentioned, in a way, you know, I, I would want to say that it's not as if like, I'm against the changing of laws, rules and regulations. I think if we look about, uh, if we think about, you know, how Prof. Buger talked about the evolution of the discussion of maritime security, you know, when developments and things change around us, you know, there, there necessarily need to be some changes, but the process needs to be inclusive. All parties need to be included, need to be at the table to discuss that change. So this is where, you know, um, speaking from a small island state of, of Singapore, um, I sincerely hope that it's not going to be based on balance of power in that sense, <laughs> where, you know, small states would have no speaking um, rights at all. Um, but coming back to the point about, you know, if, if the vision is one of, you know, um, governance based on laws, rules and norms, I don't think we need to close the door into any changes, but I must emphasize that if, if we are to be at that process, all um, stakeholders have to be at the table. Thank you. Yeah, I think I agree with Dr. Litt. It's, it's basically law, norms and orders, which are tempered by the realism that, uh, uh, balance of power will cause certain friction and uh, some disappointment, but I think it shouldn't let us uh, lose our focus from the vision, larger vision of a rules-based order. Thank you. I, I really love this question because, uh, you know, I do think that it tend, does tend to be a focus on um, balance of power, and we can certainly see the ways in which that is affected, the maritime security thinking, I mean, part of the big reason for the U.S. pivot to the Pacific is because of China's growing power. Um, but if we only look at the balance of power or if we um, prioritize that, um, then we miss things like Solomon Islands. Um, we miss things like 
um, illegal fishing. We miss things like environmental destruction. There's so many things that are missed if that is our primary or only lens. And so, you know, as I talked about at the start, we need an integrated analysis. Yes, we need to look at material conditions. We also need to look at ideational factors, and we need to be looking at it through the lens of not just great powers, but by all parties in the region, because if we want to solve these issues, the only way we're going to come up with cooperative solutions is to be engaging with everybody in the region rather than just prioritizing and, and um, you know, putting the spotlight on, on you know, key allies of great powers. Thanks. I, I just, that's sort of the route to failure. Just to um, echo that, my first point here would be that balance of power does not lead uh, us anywhere. We are in an age of connectivity and complexity. Just think uh, cyberspace and so on. How can you balance power there? This is like literally the, the wrong way of uh, thinking about it. Does that mean that power doesn't matter? No, obviously not. Right? Uh, a lot of things in the world happen exactly because of power, because power is productive but also restrictive. Are we then only talking about law, norms, and order? I'm not so sure. Um, I think today at the panel you heard about a lot of other terms uh, that quite obviously are equally important. Uh, I have on my list stuff such as habits, and what are we used, used to do? Trust, what kind of relationships do we build with each other? But perhaps also expectations, all right. What kind of expectations do we have towards actors, what is appropriate and what not, but also accountability. And as I said before, um, I'm, I'm actually an, an optimist, and uh, we have come quite a far way uh, in taking the ocean and its problems seriously over the last 10 years. And this is literally a shift. Um, <clears throat> with one of my colleagues, I sometimes call it the ocean revolution, actually, that has uh, taken place to, uh, to take the, the problems of the ocean uh, serious. And uh, now it's up to us to make something out of that ocean revolution rather than thinking about the world as a big cake that can be split up uh, through some power calculations. That would be sad. If, if I could just make a comment on that, that's a great note to finish on. And, and probably really demonstrates uh, the diversity and, and different opinions and, and great conversation from all the panelists. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, sir, panelists, thank you uh, for sharing your candid perspectives with us today. Um, your insights have been really thought provoking and I know it's been a really long day, so thank you for your patience. And patience with me because I'm pretty sure I've obliterated your surnames repeatedly. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in thanking our speakers, please? So that is um, the end of session six, and it concludes today's uh, program. Thank you all for your attendance, and for those that are um, here tomorrow, it will start at 8.30. Thanks very much. <laughs>